Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is about hummingbirds. It turns out that amongst all the animals with a backbone in the animal kingdom, the one with the very highest metabolic rates, the hummingbird, when they're hovering, they're about 10 times the metabolic rate of what a human can do on a pound for pound basis. And most of the diet though comes from sugar, things like nectar, and they would be considered diabetic if they were humans. But to burn through that sugar so rapidly, they keep their wings fluttering 60 to 80 times a second. And they eat so much food so fast as they burn it that they eat one and a half to three times their weight in nectar and insects per day. And the ruby throat, the ruby throated hummingbirds have a metabolism a hundred times that of a big animal like an elephant, which is kind of cool because we're all animals, we all run on mitochondria, but there are some serious differences between how we sense the environment and how we, we use what we get in the form of food and light and all the other signals uh, to tell our bodies what to do, uh, which, is, which is why, as you can well imagine, I've been mastering the art of foreshadowing lately. Uh, we might have something to do with metabolism in today's episode. <laughs> and that's because today's guest is a guy I referenced heavily in Headstrong, my book on cognitive function and mitochondrial hacking. And his name is Dr. Frank Schallenberger. He's been practicing as a physician for more than four decades in conventional and alternative medicine. He was a, a Western doctor earlier in his career and found he just wanted to know more than uh, what happens in a hospital. <laughs> Decided the body was a self-healing mechanism and that our lifestyle, our belief systems, bad exercise and toxins were what was breaking his patients. And as you well know, I am very much in alignment with that method. And Dr. Schallenberger is one of the guys who's revolutionized the practice of anti-aging and preventative medicine since the very early days of those fields. And his work, the stuff that really transformed my uh, first recovery from mold toxicity and all this other bad stuff I had going on, including obesity and early risk for stroke and heart disease and arthritis and chronic fatigue syndrome and blah, 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 all the bad stuff. Uh, it was his work on ozone, and he has a patented measure, a patented method to measure mitochondrial function, metabolism, oxygen utilization, and then can do something about it with stuff that most of us haven't heard of. We're going to talk about it, and some of this is in his most recent book called Bursting with Energy. He's also written a book on type 2 diabetes. So Dr. Frank Schallenberger, it's an honor to have you on the show. You, uh, your work is seminal in the field, has made a huge difference in changing the industry of functional medicine. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dave. It's a pleasure to be able to talk about these things, of course. And it kind of makes me sad. We were neighbors for a while. I yeah. used to live uh, in outside Lake Tahoe in Nevada, and you're in Carson City. I was about 10 miles away from you, but I never knew your clinic was there. Or we would have just gone out for coffee. But since I'm not there anymore, just for people listening, we're talking uh, live from uh, Nevada, and I'm up here on Vancouver Island. All right. You're 40 years into a career as a doctor. What made you decide that you were going to focus on mitochondria before everyone else did? Um, it's interesting. Uh, in the in the early '80s, I learned about ozone therapy. In the early '80s, that, that's really early. Yeah, and, and I was one of the first guys that actually brought it over here to the U.S. And, and interestingly enough, uh, it has a history that goes all the way back to the late 1800s in the U.S. Uh, the Florida Medical Association produced a paper in the early 1900s, and Loyola School of uh, of sciences in Chicago produced a paper in like 1885 describing ozone therapy. So it does go way back, but but uh, I was one of the first guys that actually kind of brought it back from Germany in the early 80s. And the thing was, after a while, I just noticed that unlike most any other therapy, whether it's natural or pharmaceutical, usually these other therapies have kind of a limited spectrum of what they do. Uh, it, took, it didn't take me long to figure out that ozone is good in almost every case you see. It's good for heart problems, good for car uh, toxicity problems, it's good for uh, low metabolic problems, it's good for stress, it's good for sleep, it's all these things. And, and you ask yourself, how can one thing be responsible for you know improving people with so many different things? And so you gotta look at the core, what's core? 
And, and I just, you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure out I'm giving oxygen. That's what ozone is. So I'm giving oxygen. Everybody's getting better. Ergo, the problem probably has something to do with oxygen, specifically how the body's using oxygen. And that's how I got into the whole metabolic thing. I started looking around and saying, okay, we've got to start measuring people's metabolism because I'll bet you nickel that after I give them a course of ozone therapy, their metabolism's going up. And so I developed this technique that you referred to on how to measure mitochondrial function. And indeed, that's what happens. Uh, you, you get the ozone, the mitochondrial function, and the mitochondrial function improves. And at that point, I decided, you know, that's the holy grail. The holy grail is to figure out how to optimize mitochondrial function. And to do that, you got to measure it first. You measure it. If it's great already, fine. There's not much you need to do. If it's not, then that keys you in um, that, you know, it's time to do something. Make some changes. There are two big things I want to talk with you about. Uh, one is that uh, other things you can do with mitochondrial function. But let's first zoom in on what ozone therapy is, assuming a lot mm -hmm. of listeners have probably heard me mention a thing or two. But let's talk about how it works, how it's administered, and the kinds of things you see clinically. And then I'll share some of my own stories, uh, because I've been doing this at home for nearly 20 years. Uh, and not nece that's not necessarily a good idea for people to do it at home. It can be dangerous, but hey, I'm a professional biohacker. I'm married to an MD. It helps. <laughs> so um, what is it? Give us the overview. Okay, so basically for the audience, Ozone is molecular O3 versus the regular form of oxygen, which is the kind that is in the air we're breathing right now, which is molecular form O2, meaning that uh, while regular oxygen contains two oxygen atoms, ozone contains three. And that extra oxygen atom makes it a very unstable molecule, such that when we put it in the human body, and you can put it in the human body in a lot of different ways. Uh, you can expose the blood to it. That's probably the most common way. You can also put it in various body cavities, stomachs, vaginas, bladders, rectums, uh, wherever you, you can inject it into joints. You can inject into backs. You can inject it into soft tissues. You can uh, give it transdermally. In, in the sense of a sauna, where the person's in a sauna, and then you flood that sauna with gas, and it absorbs transdermally. But what, it, however way that you get the ozone in the body, the very first thing that it does is instantaneously react with that third oxygen molecule, such that in actuality, the ozone's gone very quickly after you put it in the body, and instead what you have is the reactive products, which are, are primarily, um, uh, lipoperoxides or lipids that have been oxidized. So the ozone's gone in essence. Now you're left with these pile of lipoperoxides. They work locally and that, that's what works all the magic of ozone is these peroxides. They hang out locally and they do stuff locally. So if I just put it in your rectum, they'll have some local application there. Uh, and uh, then, but your body will also absorb these peroxides and they'll get systemic and they'll go all throughout your body. And that's what mediates all the effects. Traditionally speaking, uh, peroxides are oxidative free radical species that are supposed to be bad for us. We take antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera. Why are these peroxides good for us? Well, that's a great question. We're, we're, we're led to believe that free radicals are in fact bad. Nothing in our body that our body makes is bad, bad. Yeah. There's always a reason for it. And I don't like it when, you know, people come up and say, oh, yeah, such and such is bad. Well, the Paracelsus taught us it's, it's not the substance itself that determines whether it's good or bad. It's the dose. And uh, so oxidants are and, and even free radicals in the correct dose in the correct amount are actually highly beneficial. And that's what you get from exercise, right? You exercise, you get free radicals, Indeed. the body adapts, things improve. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So in, in my case, I learned how to do ozone therapy from an 88-year-old dentist in the Bay mm -hmm. Area um, who's since passed away. And he, he recognized my interest in this and said, oh, let me teach you how to do it. And he was using it for dental patients with incredible results and showed me which gear to buy, told me how to do it. And I was dealing with serious brain fog uh, back in the day. And it turns out I was living in a house with toxic mold. And it causes autoimmune issues and just... 
exhaustion where, where at the end of the day, you're putting one foot in front of the other, but it's every ounce of effort you have and you go to sleep and you wake up feeling hungover and, and it just never ends. So I, I did rectal ozone therapy. What that means is you get about a liter of ozone gas, which smells kind of like after it rains or after an electrical arc. You don't want to breathe this stuff. It's really bad for your lungs. And you, uh, to put it in a, a really, uh, just really medical term, you stick it up your ass <laughs> with a, a very small catheter. Uh, so I did that. I'm saying, this is a little odd, but I'm going to try it. And within 30 seconds of doing that, I felt my brain wake up. And it only lasted for a minute or two. But I, so I feel like myself again. And then it went away. And so I said, all right, I'm done. And I did this every night when I wasn't flying somewhere uh, for about 18 months. And every day I would get another minute or two of additional brain function time until a lot of the problems I'd had just went away. And, and it's one of those things where if, if I wreck my metabolism flying around the world or eating something I shouldn't eat or whatever, I do ozone therapy and it comes right back online. So what happened to me then? Why did it work like that? It's hard to say, but obviously it, it opened up something. That rapid response, uh, it probably just, uh, you know, these peroxides cross the blood brain barrier. Maybe they had some kind of if immediate effect. We, we don't normally see that. Normally you have to do uh, in the order of 10 to 12, maybe 14 treatments before you actually start to see things like that happen. You got to build up these peroxides, in other words. Not sure why that happened to you. It may have been lack of blood flow to the brain, which is something that yeah. toxic mold can do. So it could have just been a pure oxygen effect, but my sleep quality improved. And mm. I mean, since then, I've used it on my kids, not that way, but uh, local skin infections that really would require antibiotics gone in two treatments. I mean, really, stuff that if you were to just talk about this, people would say that's not possible, except. It's so routine, and it costs two cents worth of oxygen in order to do it, and it, it, it's so big, but it, it's unheard of outside of a few alternative medicine things. Uh, yeah. Why do you think it's just unheard of in the States, even though Germany, Cuba, Russia, it, it's much more common? You know, most problems probably relate to communication, and uh, I, I don't think we've really been communicating uh, really well with this. Uh, on the one hand, we we traditionally communicate to the people that are already interested in alternatives. And that limits it. There's not prob the majority of the population that could care less about alternatives or care less about anti-aging. Uh, and, and so we're limiting ourselves. The majority of doctors out there are not interested in alternative stuff. And, and so, so one of the biggest messages I have to tell people about ozone therapy is that it combines well with everything else. And, you know, I'm quick to tell a cardiologist or a neurologist or an endocrinologist or an oncologist, hey, add ozone therapy to what you already do. You don't have to stop doing what you're doing. Just add it in there and do it for about 30 days and then talk to me and tell me that you're not getting instantly better results. And that's sort of the message we got to get out there is it's not one or the other. It works great with what you're already doing. When I wrote Headstrong with mitochondrial function as the backbone for making your brain work better, uh, people who are listening who've read it, and a lot of you have, thank you, um, if you're taking the time to do that, uh, you know that your brain has more mitochondria per cell than other parts of the body, and the heart's also very high in those things. So if they aren't working well and you do get more mitochondrial activation, you're probably going to feel it in those areas first. Um, mm. And when I, I look at Every degenerative disease, I mean, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, autism, uh, some of the autoimmune things, diabetes, they all, when you wrap enough layers down, they come down to energy metabolism. That's right. And you have, you have something that you've been using clinically for a, a very long time that goes to the lowest possible common denominator. And you make that better, the foundation gets stronger. And of course, you can then apply whatever other medical interventions, but it makes sense just as a scientist that, yeah, those would work better if there's a stronger foundation and the body has enough energy to fold proteins or clean out cells or do whatever it's supposed to do. And we know where the energy comes from now. In terms of, of the latest and greatest ozone therapy, there's something called 10 pass ozone, where a physician will pull some of your blood out, mix it with ozone, re-inject it and do that 10 times, uh, which has a, a pretty darn big effect on the body, but it's also one of the more invasive things you have to use heparin and it takes some time yeah. If you put that at one end of the spectrum as sort of the 
the big bad amazing ozone uh, uh, spectrum thing you can do, and not bad in a negative way, but just you know, big bad tough. And then on the other end, you can put ozone in drinking water and gulp it and get ozone in the in the stomach, which is the easiest thing you could possibly do. Yeah. Can you walk me through just a little, a few of the details of all the different things between there, the, the reasons we might want to put ozone in different places and, and some of the types of mm-hmm. benefits or, or how we would know when to put it where? Okay, I, I'm, I'm thinking your question might have something to do with dose. Well, the dose is part of it, but okay. but for people who are listening going, okay, I know that there's this gas. I think it's a pollutant in the atmosphere, but now I know it's a signaling molecule in the body. There's many different ways to put it in the body. Just kind of walk people who don't know any of that stuff oh, okay. uh, just through the, me- the places you'd put it and, and why. And then, of course, the fact that dose matters is just weave that in. Okay, so... You know, and basically, I guess you could break it down to two ways. One is there are system ways to treat yourself systemically. In other words, everything gets these peroxides go everywhere. Uh, the best way to do that is actually with the blood because you're going straight into the blood. Uh, the other uh, and that is, by the way, you take blood out of the body into a container, glass or special plastic, inject ozone, which is a gas, into that container. It mixes in with the blood and instantly creates these peroxides. So now you've got a bottle full of peroxides. There's no ozone in there anymore. It's just a bunch of peroxides. And you've got white cells also in there uh, that have been affected by these peroxides. You then infuse those white cells and all those peroxides back into the patient. And those peroxides go everywhere and mediate what ozone does. That's, that's sort of the best known systemic therapy that there is. Uh, other ways to do it uh, are you alluded to put it in the colon. Now, the, the thing about when you put it up your rectum is that these peroxides first drain straight to the liver. That's that's what drains out of there. And so it's it's a direct liver treatment. So if you think in hepatitis, you're going to think more that way. I mean, now, you might could combine them too, do the rectal and then do the systemic in, say, a case of hepatitis. Uh, you can put them locally if you have uh, conditions of the bladder either a superficial cancer of the bladder or a, 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 a chronic cystitis of the bladder, you can inject it in there. And it'll and, and these peroxides will be locally there. Now, there, some of them will get absorbed systemically, but now you got more of that local effect. You can, as you mentioned, you can ozonate water. You can then drink the water. You can apply the water into your eyes. You can swish the water around in your gums for dental issues. Uh, you can inject the water into a vagina for a, um, a douche sort of thing for various ailments down there. Um, you can also, Tesla in 1904 was the first guy that created ozonated oil. Mm-hmm. He created ozonated olive oil. And then you can take this oil and you can eat it. It's full of peroxides. So you could eat it. You could uh, put it on tissues. You know, put it on your skin or, you know, you can inject the oil. We've injected into bladders. We've injected into uh, um, tumors. We've injected into uh, rectum. So, I mean, does that kind of get to the question a little bit? Yeah. So, you now people listening are, are thinking, all right, there's a bunch of different ways you can use this stuff. And we touched on how it turns on uh, mitochondria by giving mm. them these... Uh, these lipids that are oxidized, which causes them to wake up and create more of their own uh, endogenous a- antioxidants uh, and to function better. But it also has a pretty strong antimicrobial effect. Can you walk me through what happens with yeast, fungi, viruses, uh, bacteria, cancer, like like the whole you know the whole spectrum of, of things where it might have an impact? Yes. So um, there's two aspects to this. One, ozone, the gas is is a, a potent antimicrobial uh, potent against all microbes whether they're viruses or mold or bacteria doesn't ma- much matter uh, and meaning that even small amounts is for example they use it to, to uh, uh, purify water systems las vegas entire water system is done with ozone and they'll tell you down there that the ozone is something like hundreds of times more effective per gram weight than chlorine is a very powerful anti. So in that case, you get the ozone gas directly on the problem. Now, the peroxides themselves don't aren't, aren't all that antimicrobial. What they do is they interact with the white cells in your body to induce a, a, a greater secretion of cytokines. 
these cytokines are the molecules that cause your immune system to get rid of the microbial infection. Because the reality is if, if somebody has an, a compromised immune reaction and they get exposed to a bacteria, they may not be able to knock that bacteria out. Uh, and they're going to maybe are an antibiotic. Uh, whereas somebody else that has a really active immune system, you know, won't require the antibiotic. They'll, they'll make their own cytokines and they'll deal with it themselves. And so ozone can upregulate all that cytokine thing, by these, that's what these peroxides do. So in that way, they come at it through the immune system, but not directly. So you got a direct action of the ozone gas, then you got an indirect action against uh, microbes through the cytokine effect on white cells from the peroxides. Uh, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, going back probably 100 plus episodes, I interviewed Robert Rowan, who was using mm -hmm. ozone therapy in Africa during an Ebola outbreak and having people get rid of Ebola. Uh, several cases he wrote up, actually, which is a, a pretty horrible disease. And you mentioned earlier hepatitis. Uh, so what's your take on using ozone for these chronic infections that just grind people down, even Lyme disease? Are, are, are you seeing... Sure. Are you seeing results from using ozone in places where antibiotics just aren't working? Problem with antibiotics are is you got to have an immune system to back them up. <laughs> when you take an antibiotic, whether it's for strep or I don't care what you got, you're not going to kill every crummy germ in that body. You're going to kill most of them and then allow the immune system at that point to come in and take over. So you take the antibiotic for 10 days or seven days or whatever the doctor tells you. And at the end of that 10 days, don't go thinking that you don't, none, that germ is completely eradicated from your body. It's not. It's there, but it's been knocked down to the point that your immune system can take over unless it can't. And this is the problem. Uh, like, let's use Ebola for an example. It kills like something like 85% of the people that are infected with it. But interestingly enough, it doesn't kill 10%. So what's up with that? You know, if it's such a virulent uh, uh, organism, how come in the 10 percent? What's the difference between the 10 percent and the 90 percent? And clearly it has to do with immune system reactivity, which is why if you take the other 90 percent and give them ozone at the same time, they're getting whatever treatments they're getting. You know, they give them supported treatments like IVs and such. But you do all that and then do the ozone at the same time. Your results are infinitely better. I have an example of that. After Burning Man a couple years ago, I started to get uh, styes in one of my eyes. And these are mm -hmm. essentially infected uh, tear ducts, um, probably from some dust exposure. And I got rid of the first one, and I tried a bunch of different antibiotic eye drops. And it took a very long time to heal. And I got another one a few months later, and it became a chronic thing. So the last time it happened, I said, all right, what can I do about this? And I put low-strength ozone gas, about 20 gamma for people listening. And I drilled a hole in the side of my, funny enough, my Burning Man goggles, kept my eyes closed because you don't want to put ozone gas on your, your actual eyeball itself. And just kept my eyes closed, listened to uh, something on headphones for 20 minutes while ozonating the outside of my eyes, which sterilizes everything essentially. And you know what happened? The sty reversed. It never happened all the way. And it, it made a, just a, a giant difference when cortisol and eye drops together were taking weeks to deal with this it was gone in a couple days and, and did you did it stop coming back at that point uh i had one more time where they started coming back and uh, i did the same thing with it and it went away and what i'm sure i did is i pretty much got rid of whatever microbes had taken residence there where they're simply gone yeah uh and I, i'm doing some other stuff i've had chronic dries for years at, i think living in a moldy environment and probably lasik surgery did that but the you know, better, better taking care of my eyes. Uh, my anti-aging plan is to live to at least 180. And I realize I probably won't have functioning eyes when I'm 140. Otherwise it's going to sort of suck. Uh, so I'm, I'm taking more, more care there. Uh, yeah. But, but that's just for people listening. That's a weird example where I've never seen, you know, topical use of it on the eyes, but uh, my daughter had an ear that was going to need really big antibiotics. It was three times its normal size after a scratch from a rosebush. We put a funnel of ozone on it. And two days later, it's back when Neosporin didn't touch it. And, it just, I, I feel like everybody listening who realizes, wait, this is this is a potent thing. It's almost free. The gear to do it at home, if you're trained so you don't breathe the stuff and all that, 
it runs about $1,500 and the cheap stuff from China runs about 300 bucks. Uh, but if you go to a doctor who's trained on how to do it, like you are, and I think you actually train physicians on how to do this, right? Yeah, yes. Um, there's a wealth of chronic things that have been irritating you for years mm -hmm. uh, that can be uh, just overnight or at least over a short period of weeks uh, turned on, in my own experience, in a way that nothing else does. But it's totally out of uh, the consciousness of of so many people. And, and that's you know why you're on the show, because you're uh, the the most experienced ozone doctor uh, that I'm aware of. Um, how common is it to be able to find an ozone doctor in the typical <clears throat> city now? The, the, we formed the American Academy of Ozone Therapy about, I think it's eight years ago now. And we have maybe 250, 300 members, I'm not sure. Uh, but these are all practitioners of various sorts. So there's DOs in there, MDs, naturopaths, nurse practitioners, anybody with a license that can administer these therapies. And so people could go to the website and they can see some referrals there. They could probably just Google their area. Unfortunately, what you say is right. For a lot of people, especially if they're in outlying areas, they're gonna to have to travel to find somebody that knows what they're doing. What are the risks of uh, buying some random ozone machine online and doing it at home? I wrote a book about this mm -hmm. called The Ozone Miracle and specifically for lay people. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they can get that on Amazon.com, and it kind of walks them right through. This is how you do rectal. This is the problem you can get into. This is what you got to look out for. This is the dose. So it's like paint by numbers type of book. T tell me the name one more time. It's called The Ozone Miracle. All right. That is a book absolutely worth reading. I was hoping you're going to drop the name because I couldn't remember it. <laughs> but it's uh, this is the sort of thing you can do, and you can do it safely, but I would not recommend anyone inject ozone without a doctor's, uh, without Absolutely. a doctor's help. That's, that's you, potentially an issue. Yeah, you can die. Well, we'll just be real straightforward. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and, and for people who are maybe not going to get the book and try and do something, if you breathe ozone gas, what happens, Dr. Schellenberger? If you breathe ozone gas, uh, Dave, as you probably know, you won't do it again. <laughs> that will be one time only. Because you're going to spend about the next half an hour to two hours coughing your head off, depending on how much you got and how reactive your airway is. Uh, if you're unfortunate enough to have asthma, it could be really bad. You could throw you into a status asthmaticus. Um, so yeah, one needs to be very careful about getting big whiffs of ozone. Are <laughs> you going to be coughing your butt off? That, by the way, is vitamin C. Oh, interesting. Just oral yeah, vitamin so C? Yeah, so if somebody sucks up a bunch of ozone, I get one, two of these calls a year usually. I'll tell them to you know take uh, 20 grams of oral vitamin C and it'll calm down in about a half an hour. Oh, that's good. What if you do a bunch of vitamin C before ozone therapy? Not a good idea. Exactly. You know, it's, it's good. You're, going, you're going to create, uh, instead of these peroxides, you're going to create dehydroscorbate, which is beneficial but not doesn't do the same thing that the peroxides do. There are a lot of people who have been practicing anti-aging medicine for decades, um, who especially if, if they got started during the, the orthomolecular time, uh, where that was an early name for the field, uh, where very high dose vitamin C uh, was, was in vogue, mm. 20, 30 grams a day. And by the way, I've, I've done that for several years when I was recovering from things, and it, it did have some benefits. What's your take on super high dose vitamin C? Uh, I don't use it nearly as much as I used to for general purposes. But I'm using, and, and this would be high dose, right? But I'm using very typically 25 grams of C as a chaser on the ozone therapy. Oh, really? So after, yeah. So and and you know, by the way, I'm not the only guy doing this. There's a couple of very prominent docs in Europe that are doing this, and uh, and then Tom Levy uh, is onto this, and uh, some of the other docs that have been proponents for vitamin C. Uh, you know who else is? Uh, uh, Dave Hunting Hockey, I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's the, out there uh, at the, the uh, uh, Hugh Reardon Clinic, and they do specialize in high-dose vitamin is C. Is it Dave or is it Ron Hunting Hake? Ron, Ron. Yeah, yes, I've did. interviewed Ron Hunting Hake. Okay, Ron, yeah, he, yeah. He, was a, he was a great interview, too, for people yeah, listening. He's a great yeah. guy, super knowledgeable, and, and the deal is you're infusing these peroxides, so now you've got a bloodstream full of lipoperoxides, then you throw in the uh, vitamin C. Now, these lipoperoxides are already doing their thing. So that's established. Now, as you're putting the vitamin C in there over the next hour and a half, 
the vitamin C is interacting with a lot of these peroxides, producing a redox shift in vitamin C. And, a, and by the way, you do this with glutathione, get the same effect. Mm. The body reads the redox potential of vitamin C and glutathione. It reads it. It monitors it. Because when it sees that redox potential go off in one way or the other, it's going to respond to that. So the vitamin C and the ozone actually amplify the response that you get from the peroxides. It's quite fascinating. Uh, we make a dry liposomal capsule of glutathione uh, at Bulletproof, and I, I do take that after I do ozone therapy, usually about an hour afterwards. Any sense on timing when you'd want to do that? Half hour, hour? We do it. We do the intravenous right after, okay. immediately after. So right after would be fine. We do intravenous glutathione at Bulletproof Labs in Santa Monica. That's one of the things I use when I'm recovering from travel and all. Uh, but we don't do ozone therapy there because we're we're more of a, a nutrient IV and testing facility, not a not a treatment facility. And uh, it's in a separate medical clinic that's you know part of the model. Uh, and and those things are are missing from a lot of this this conversation. How do you feel really good after you cross the country twice in two days mm. on airplanes? I can tell you, I, there's usually a needle in my arm if I want to be really at the top of my game. Uh, and certainly there would be ozone if I had it there. Okay. Let, let's shift gears a bit and let's talk about mitochondria. Uh, because okay. in your book, you talk about how ozone, in addition to making that extra, uh, that extra oxygen molecule, it also creates a free electron that can enter the electron chain transport in the mitochondria. The mitochondria's job is to make, elect, uh, to make electrons for energy. And all of a sudden you're tossing in an extra one how does that work? Uh, okay, uh, there's, there's a number. Primarily, it works by oxidizing NADH. Are, are you familiar with that ratio, the NAD-NADH ratio? It's absolutely in, in Headstrong, and people listening, okay. though, may not have read it or probably don't remember. There's a lot of science in there. Will you walk us through it? This ratio is, is the, the sort of the holy grail of being healthy, is to maintain a healthy ratio of this stuff called NAD, which is a niacin-derived molecule, uh, and NADH, which is uh, the reduced form of that molecule. So NAD is the oxidized form of the molecule, uh, and NADH is the reduced form of the molecule. The way this works is, in healthy cytoplasms of a really healthy person with operative mitochondrial function, uh, you're going to have an NAD to NADH ratio of, uh, of 700 to 1. It's gigantic, wow. the shift. It's outstanding, amazing. You think of any differential in molecules of 7 to 1, you know that gradient is just astounding. And this is what pushes everything in that cell. Every single thing in that cell is pushed by, uh, by is determined by this ratio. As that ratio goes down, as the NADH accumulates and the NAD goes down, uh, so, so as the ratio gets from 701 maybe to 650 to 1 to 600 to 1, everything in that cell slows down. And it's the, and it's the oxygen transport system, this electron tr transport system that you're talking about, that produces that ratio. So what's happening is when a sick people person comes into my office, I can, I can, you know, very quickly say, oh, look, you're sick, you're old, you're, you're feeble, you got problems, ergo, you have a defective NAD-NADH ratio. I don't have to measure it because I can measure the mitochondria directly and they'll be done and that tells me the ratio is defective. And we can improve that ratio by improving the mitochondria. That's kind of, in a sense, the major job of mitochondria is to maintain that ratio. What takes that ratio off? And, and I know half of people under age 40, thanks to your, your research of larger populations, half of them have a problem. And everyone over age 40, we call it aging. We have issues with this ratio. What, what's the cause of the ratio getting disturbed? Ah, now you're getting down to it. So, so I would say that the, uh, one of the most insidious causes, uh, and by that, the one of the most constant causes is having uh, birthdays. Yeah, those damn birthdays. Yeah, those damn birthdays are going to mess you up. Uh, normally, you're pretty good up until around the age of 40. And at from 40 to about 50, the only people probably that are going to notice the decline are going to be, you know, athletes or somebody that has a performance issue. And they're going to notice, you know, they, they just can't do what they used to do. 
Uh, but the rest, all the normal human beings aren't going to start to notice it till like after the age of 50, 55 ish. And then the older you get, as the mitochondrial function depresses more and more, it's going to get to a point where everything starts to unravel. For some people, that could be at the age of 45, by the way. It, it happened to me at 25. So. Yeah. It, <laughs> I'm not going back. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the other things that come to play, um, besides having birthdays, are um, uh, infections. Mm -hmm. Infections uh, create, uh, can poison the mitochondria. Heavy metals can poison the mitochondria, most notably mercury. But all the heavy metals, that's how they exert their toxicity is by screwing up the electron transport chain. Antibiotics? Yeah, the drugs doctors yeah. give are potent, a lot of them, potent, my statins, a potent <laughs> mitochondrial suppressant, uh, steroids, mitochondrial suppressants, a lot of the diabetes drugs, a lot of the cardiac drugs, a lot of these antibiotics, as you just pointed out, the newer newer uh, uh, chain of antibiotics are actually mitochondrial suppressants. They kill the bacteria by disabling their mitochondria, uh, but at the same time, they can disable our mitochondria too. About 15 years ago, I went on metformin, which is a, a common anti-diabetes yeah. drug, lowers blood sugar. And the reason I went on it is a bunch of studies came out that said it mimics fasting and it's probably an anti-aging drug and a lot of my anti-aging physician friends still use it. And I stopped using it because there was about a 30% suppression in mitochondrial function. And my anti-aging predominant theory is keep those guys running like they were when you were 18, assuming you were healthy when you were 18, and you're probably gonna live longer and you're gonna like your life better anyway. So what's your take on it? There's a lot of benefits to metformin, but it's also got that mitochondrial issue. Are you pro or con? I'm a very pro uh, metformin, but keep in mind that all these drugs that are mitochondrial, have exerted mitochondrial toxicity, don't do it the same in everybody. Mm. So the, the key is get your mitochondria measured. If, if a patient comes in to see me and they're on metformin or even on a statin, I'll measure their mitochondria. I'll find a lot of the times it's just fine. Those drugs don't screw them up. Other times it's not so good, in which case we, then we have to have that talk. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So just like different foods work for different people. Some people eat yeah. nightshades and feel good, and a lot of people eat nightshades and it wrecks their mitochondria. Uh, but how are you going to know? Will you either measure it or you just eat a lot of it and see if you feel like crap the next day? On the, on the one hand, metformin is listed as a mitochondrial suppressant. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, metformin is a potent stimulator because of its uh, fasting sort of thing of AMPK, mm -hmm. which is a marked stimulant for that, that NAD, NADH ratio. So metformin on the one hand can suppress you. On the other hand, it can actually amp you up by having a fasting type of effect. So you're, you're a fan of it. I, I keep waffling about whether I ought to try it again. But you just got to, whatever yeah. you're on a drug, and sometimes drugs are needed, yep. uh, it's, you can go get your mitochondria measured and see if it's screwing you up. If it is, that's different. I, I've looked at a ton of, of tests for mitochondria when I was writing Headstrong and even now as, yep. as I work on my living to 180. And um, yours, I would say, is the gold standard, but you've got to go into uh, your clinic or some of the other ones, and you're talking oxygen mask. I want you to explain how yours works. Uh, but when I look at all the online tests, it's very hard to tell what the heck is going on in your mitochondria. And when I say online tests, I don't mean you know, quizzes. Yeah. I, I mean where you send your blood in or, or some other substance, and they look at various ratios, or they culture it with hydrogen peroxide. Is there anything even useful uh, from a blood test perspective or muscle biopsy or anything, or do you really have to strap on an oxygen mask? Yeah, you got you got to do the VO2s. That's the only way you can functionally, because it's just impossible. Those mitochondria are going to change every second. It's impossible. You got to get overall globally, What? how is the overall global function going on in the entire body? If you just pull some cells out, forget it. You're not getting any picture at all that's going to be valuable. Yeah. It, it is definitely true. In the last month, a couple of papers came out showing marked changes in the shape of mitochondria based on very short-term things happening in the environment. So they'll, they'll get long and stretch themselves out where they make yeah. energy very differently or they'll move around in a cell. So it, it's a dynamic system. So, so let's go with that. Uh, you, you've got to test the whole system. How does your mitochondria test work? Um, what, what, all, what else is all the equipment that people strap on and what do you look at? It's, it's so incredibly simple. I can't believe nobody thought of this 100 years ago. <laughs> uh, but it's just it's a total no-brainer, which fits right in my world. 
But what, uh, all this, all that it's do doing is measuring how much oxygen your body's processing. And as you process oxygen through these systems we've been talking about, uh, you produce carbon dioxide. So if you're efficient, if your mitochondria are efficient, it's less CO2 for the amount of oxygen going in. You produce less CO2. That makes it efficient uh, on mitochondria. As they become inefficient, you, you, as you process the oxygen, per molecule of oxygen, you produce more CO2. So by looking at that ratio, it tells me how efficient your mitochondria are working. And then by looking at the volume of oxygen that you're uh, processing and relating it to your body fat percentage, your weight and your height, in other words, your body mass, uh, we can determine if you're processing a lot of oxygen for your body mass or not that much. So we learned those two things, how much oxygen can his body possibly process and how efficiently can it process it. All right, and so it's literally riding an exercise bike with a mask on that's carefully measuring CO2 and oxygen. So if the goal is to figure out how good is your body at taking a unit of food, which is already in your body in the form of glucose or ketones, plus a unit of oxygen from the air and making energy from it, you're going to know because you breathe out some amount of oxygen you didn't use, you breathe out some amount of CO2, so, and so it's a closed system other than what maybe yeah. comes out through your skin, exactly. which is nominal. So then then we know, and, and there's just no it's, arguing with that ratio. We do it over and over again. I, I'll do it on somebody, wait a half hour, do it again. Wait a half hour, do it again. I'll do it three days later. I'll do it every three days. We see, you know, a 5% five, 5 differentiating, you know, every time we do it, but mostly it's rock steady. It hangs right in there until you start doing something about it. So if you give someone a big dose of ozone, do you see a shift before and after? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's an, that's a, see, that's another way we can test things. So we can do the test on somebody and give them a form of treatment, whatever that amounts to, uh, put them in ketosis, for example, come back and retest them and see what the effect was on the mitochondria. What does ketosis do to mitochondria in your experience? Almost always, it'll double the effect within four to five days. It's astounding. Now, not always. There's a subset of the population, probably around 10 uh, 10% of people that really don't do this so well, they're more of the high carb types and they, they want to eat a lot of carbs. And if you take the carbs out, they really do not fat, uh, do uh, fat metabolism all that well. Yeah. I, I don't know how to identify that 10%. And I, I find even then, if they're on, a, on a, a diet that's higher in carbs, not sugar, but carbs, if I add brain octane, the oil we make that converts into ketones uh, a lot more than coconut oil or, or regular MCTs, they still feel better from having those ketones, but in the presence of normal amounts of glucose. So they don't do well on a you know, zero carb diet where they force their body to make ketones, but they still metabolize a little bit of extra ketone that comes in nutritionally. And they tend to feel good on that, which is a very rough marker for, it's probably mitochondrial, but we don't really know because I haven't tested it using your stuff. You can identify the, the people that need to be on a high carb diet. You can identify them because what you'll see on their mitochondrial function is um, presuming there's nothing else wrong with them, okay? But you'll see a, 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 high, a very high level of mitochondrial function and almost no fat metabolism. And now we can tell whether they're metabolite, we, in real time at any point of exercise or exertion, I can tell you uh, whether you're, how much your cells are feeding off fat versus glucose because when your cells are feeding off glucose, more carbon dioxide is produced per oxygen. When it's feeding off fat, less carbon dioxide is produced. So if I look at that ratio over time during various levels of exertion, I can tell you, okay, right now you're burning 50% glucose, 50% fat. Or right now you're burning 10% fat, 90% glucose. And, and what we see in these people that need the carbs is they burn glucose like crazy, but they do not burn fat and they're in excellent shape. If you see that combination, you know that person wants to be the person that has a high complex carb diet. Conversely, if you get a person that, that has low mitochondrial function and is feeding entirely off sugar, you got a problem. Uh, that would have been me when I weighed 300 pounds. Yeah, it would have been you. So you took, you went to the ketosis, you come back in five days and your mitochondrial function will be double. 
Easy. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, that's my experience over and over with thousands of people. And, and the trick there is, you know, Bulletproof Coffee has brain octane in it for a reason. So people drink it like, why do I feel so much better? Like, well, <laughs> there's some mitochondrial science going on there. Uh, and yeah. the other thing, and I want to get your take on this, is a recent study from UC San Diego showed that caffeine, about two small cups of coffee worth, doubled ketone production. Uh, so mm. is caffeine or coffee, and these are separate substances, but, but yeah. is either one of them something that's good for mitochondria in your experience? I, I love coffee. The date on coffee is awesome because of all the polyphenols in yeah. there. Yeah. So I love coffee. Now, I understand some people can't tolerate it because right. that's just normal with everything. But uh, I, this study you're talking about, they're talking specifically about caffeine. If you just got caffeine tablets. Yeah, it was caffeine yeah. tablets uh, yeah, that I they used. Because it's going to give you an adrenaline effect. And adrenaline is a, is a potent, epinephrine is a potent fat mobilizer. Uh, so it would just increase ketone production through epinephrine. They didn't say the mechanism. They just showed. I'm you know, pretty sure that's the mechanism. Okay, got it. And I, I definitely know that that combination, which, which you know, uh, there's all sorts of reasons that I, I think uh, synergistic reasons that it works the way it works. But in, in my own life, turning my brain on, uh, having been a former raw vegan and, you know, autoimmune issues and been obese and just recovered from way more than most humans deal with. And then to be at the peak of my health in my mid 40s, I, I know it's because I manage my mitochondria like crazy. Um, I regularly have, have ketones in my system. I take mitochondrial uh, stimulators. We manufacture some as supplements, uh, things, unusual delivery systems for PQQ and, and keto succinic mm. acid and precursors and uh, D-ribose and all, all these different things. And, and I, I rotate them around and all. But the difference in, in the clarity of my thinking uh, and, and my ability to you know, fly across the country and not be a zombie, uh, it, it feels superhuman to me. Um, and yeah, I'm, I, I, I do everything because it's, it's just how I am. And it's also because I don't want to go back to where I was. How much mitochondrial stimulation does the average person need to feel a difference, whether it's ozone or something else? Uh, you know, how you feel, it can be misleading. Yeah. Uh, so you can have somebody that feels really tired and run down because their adrenals are no good. This right. is classic. Right. And in actuality, their mitochondria are just fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, and the, but they feel like crap. So I, I, you know, I when I'm talking to patients about that, I said, well, think of those guys that are in the Tour de France. They obviously have pretty good mitochondria, but at the end of the day, they're pretty pooped out. So th that's kind of how it go goes. So you can have great mitochondria, and still be have your adrenals wasted. The other part of it, if your adrenals are really good and you, you mitochondrial shot, you might actually say to yourself, you know, I feel pretty good. Now, now, what you won't know is, you know, how do you feel when you ride your bike up a mountain pass? Uh, because people that say, I feel really good, and at the same time have poor mitochondrial function are basically people that sit on their butt all day long, and they never really test it out. They have no, they don't know what their maximum might have been. They're at such a low level of existence, they don't really notice the difference. Okay. Athletes notice. Uh, regular people don't necessarily notice that their mitochondria are going bad every year. Uh, the first place it shows up uh, in my research is a cognitive function. It's those little tweaks on cognitive function because you have so much mitochondrial density in the brain. And I can't quite remember that or uh, more of the emotional crankiness. And for those people, you give them a mitochondrial stimulant, whether it's ozone or any of these other compounds, their emotional regularity improves uh, to the point that the stuff we use in Keto Prime in two different studies is now um, approved for, for claims on improves the emotional symptoms of PMS. And so mm. you get that additional crankiness that comes in. You take something that uh, I'm hypothesizing here, the, me the mechanism of action is that it's increasing mitochondrial function because it does that. And then all of a sudden, people have better emotional control. Um, have you, do you see that in patients? They report improvements in mood when, when you work on their mitochondria? Interestingly enough, um, when you're talking, I'm thinking of about a psychiatrist uh, in New York that reported to our society a couple years ago that he finds that ozone therapy is, is pretty good for, you know, all kinds of these mental disturbances that he sees. So I thought that's pretty darn interesting. What's the mechanism behind all that? It's probably half infectious and half yeah, mitochondrial. So, I mean, how that, that, brain, that brain needs, it figures a lot of stuff out. 
you want it to be working pretty well. Uh, you, you do indeed. <laughs> and, and that's yeah. one of those things, as we look at an aging population, uh, that's one of the first things that goes. And you know, a third to a half of people listening, if they don't do any of the stuff that we're talking about, if you just play the odds, they're, they're not gonna know their name at, at the end of their life, uh, which is really sad. And I don't think it's yeah. necessary anymore. What's your take on Alzheimer's? What are the, the big things in your 40 years of clinical practice that are probably preventative? Oh, boy, that's that's right in there for it. I do think it's a mitochondrial disease for sure. Um, we do know that at least in culture, if you take brain cells in culture you'll and you put various chemicals on them, you can induce beta amyloid plaque in those cells. We do know that as we all get older, that beta amyloid plaque is going to be higher in you, know, in you when you're 70 than it was when you were 35. Uh, now, presumably, we'll keep it down to a minimal amount. So, you know, you got to be really, really old before it affects you. Uh, but but Alzheimer's is, is in my world, is not really treatable. Uh, we're just kind of getting the stem cells, maybe with stem cells. But uh, outside of that, it's it's not been treatable, but it's entirely preventable. It's one of those diseases I don't think anybody really has to get. Yeah, Dale Bredesen's work lately has been really seminal. Just interviewed him, you wrote The End of Alzheimer's, and there's... There's some profound, hopeful stuff, even for people who have early onset Alzheimer's, or I think yeah. they can stave it off for a long time. And uh, I, I would not be opposed to those people starting out uh, with a little bit of ozone along with the other lifestyle changes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, you've been practicing anti-aging medicine. You're a member of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. How long do you think someone who's 20 years old today can live if they're managing things right. Let me let me put it to you this way: uh, the best way to live long is don't get sick, <laughs> don't get a disease. Yeah. That's what's knocking people off. Yeah, you, know, you the listeners can just ask themselves: When's the last time I heard of somebody dying of nothing in their sleep? And it reminds me of an old Red Fox joke. And he used to ask, uh, uh, you know, imagine he used, he used to say, imagine all those health nuts. He'd be smoking a cigarette and drinking the whiskey while he's saying this. You imagine all those health nuts laying in hospitals, dying of nothing. And, <laughs> and so that's the deal. If you just don't die from these diseases, if you prevent the dang diseases, and that's all mitochondrial, you do not get sick if you have healthy mitochondrial. I never see anybody sick that's got good mitochondria, and I never see anybody uh, who's healthy and vibrant that doesn't have good mitochondria. It's just that's the way it taps out. Now, there's the thing I like to get, though, is early on, the mitochondria start going south for a good 10, 15 years before a disease actually shows up. Mm -hmm. So you wait till you get that. You want to check your mitochondria early on. If it's great, fine. But check it once a year because at some point something might happen. You don't know what that's going to be. Something might happen and your functions. It happened to me. My mitochondria function was awesome until about 63, 64, and then it just went to heck. There were a number of reasons for that. But had I not been checking it, I would not have known that. I felt fine, so to speak. Were you able to fix it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was able to fix it. The, the reality was I was eating crappy. I was drinking too much. I was stressing out. I wasn't, you know, my regular exercise deal. And I was having birthdays. So when you add it all up, this is, you know, just so you can switch it around. But my point is... That's the point of action where we ideally want to take is early on before something happens. Because whatever happens to me and whatever, however long I might live, uh, I don't want. I want to die sort of naturally, whatever that is. I don't want to have a disease. How long do you think you'll live? Gosh, uh, who knows? Uh, it's a really fascinating question. <laughs> uh, but here, here's, uh, yeah, I'm hoping I make it to a hundred. I don't care how long I live. I just want to be able to ride my bike up the mountain passes. That's all I care about. Uh, I want to be functional. Yeah. Uh, I, I do notice that I can ride up the mountain passes at 72 years old now very nicely. Not at the same time I did 20 years ago, but still pretty good. I can ride around Lake Tahoe, which is uh, what an 80 mile ride with 4,000, 4,500 feet of elevation. I can do that any old day that I want. Not as fast as I used to. But I mean, I look forward to having that functionality as I get older, at least to 100. I hope I can get to 100 uh, and at least be functional like that. And you're already so far ahead of the curve. There aren't a lot of people in their 70s who can do that. 
and i i greatly admire the the first generation of of anti-aging medicine founders who are uh, you know li- living you know the the physician heal thyself sort of thing where <laughs> the fact you could do those things says that you might know a thing or two about this and that you have the the wisdom to apply your own stuff to yourself but i mean you you look vibrant and healthy and, and your system works and you're measuring that it works and taking people's systems don't work even if they're 30 yeah. and then turning them back on so that they can have 70s like you are, which is fundamental to anti-aging, right? Well, one of the things I have always been so interested, I've been in this anti-aging movement for a long time, but you know what got me into is I'm just egocentric. <laughs> you know, I, I, I want to know how I can live long and never get sick because I, as, as a physician that's been doing this for getting up to 50 years pretty soon, all day long, you see people come in who are in one way or another miserable from a disease or a condition that's totally preventable. And I don't want to be that person. So I really come from a personal perspective on this. That's why I'm so passionate about it to a large extent. It's just for me. I don't want to get sick. I don't want to live a long time. It's okay to be selfish uh, from that perspective. And and when you have all that energy, it lets you treat your patients, it lets you be with family. You know, everyone around you benefits too. But but yeah, no one wants that. Just to admit, I don't want that. I'm not going there. It's, it's actually a little bit of an act of courage. So I'm, I'm happy you've chosen to do it because uh, your work has is, is definitely had an impact on, on my knowledge for things. I, I've got one more question for you though. Okay. Uh, Dr. Schallenberger, if someone came to you tomorrow and said, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. Um, based on everything you know, everything you lived, what are the three most important pieces of advice you'd have for me? Uh, what would you tell them? Uh, I don't know if I could boil it down to three, but I would say at the top of the heap, the, the single most important thing is be in great cardiovascular condition, not acceptable cardiac. It'd be an athletic type of almost up there uh, just great cardi- cardiovascular condition, because that's where most people go south, is in the cardiovascular system. And um, so that's just huge. And by the way, we use all that VO2 data that we were talking about to establish that program for people, because that data could tell me exactly where they need to be. Uh, after that, I'm thinking hormones, and especially in hormones, thyroid, especially yeah. thyroid. Which controls mitochondria, of course. <laughs> I, I lean on that because the thyroid blood tests that are typically used are just not reliable. Yeah. And, and we can determine whether, who, who, wh- whether somebody needs thyroid or not based upon their metabolism and actually could get to the correct dose that way. So those two things come to mind immediately. A diet is clearly in there. Probably the biggest, hugest problem with diet is carbohydrates for the majority of the population. Uh, so that's pretty huge. I don't think you can actually pick on one thing, but if I had to, I'd pick on exercise. You didn't say anything about uh, happiness, meditation, relaxation, stress. Is that is that a part of your thinking, or is it is it something that's maybe number four on the list? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. You, you've had so much experience in this stuff. I, I want to learn. What, what's your take on all that stuff? So uh, over the years, I have quite a few patients that just come in here every year, and I check their mitochondria. And they can be in their 50s, 60s, whatever. And normally, they're fine. Everything's just fine. But I could tell you all kinds of interesting cases where they come in for their annual, their mitochondria are in the tank, and literally, the only thing that has changed in their life is stress. They exercise the same way. The hormones are good. The whole, the nutrition, the diet, everything, nothing's changed except, uh, you know, they've been very stressed out. Somebody in their family's sick. Uh, they're going through a divorce. Uh, they got bad lifestyles where they run in jet, jet, in jets all over the country or whatever. Things have changed from a stress perspective, and those mitochondria, the literature is pretty clear. You can screw them up pretty much within a matter of minutes if you get all stressed out. So that that's definitely something you pay attention to. Do you yeah. do you meditate regularly? Do you do you do something like that? I I pray a lot. Okay, but I I I'm not really into meditating that way you know like blanking out the mind a little bit i might do a little bit in the morning sometime okay. but that's not a big part of my particular program Got it. well prayer is in that bucket of there's many different forms of meditation so but but you, you spend some time thinking about something else okay very very cool 
Uh, you've you've got a lot of information on your site. It's antiagingmedicine.com. Uh, you've got that URL clearly because you've been in the business for well, almost 50 years now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Back when they invented URLs, you were there. Exactly. Uh, and uh, and I just I want to say thank you for for your seminal work there on mitochondria and on on ozone therapy in particular, and just just helping to spread awareness of that because everyone listening to the show today, there can probably benefit right now from ozone therapy. And there will be a time in your life where you might be looking at buckets of antibiotics or ozone therapy. You might want to hit the ozone first and use the antibiotics second uh, if you need them still. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, on that note, uh, thank, thanks again. Thanks for being a guest on Bulletproof Radio. Really appreciate your work. Okay. Thanks for having me, Dave. Enjoyed it very much. Take care. 